thanks, Liz. I thought um, I thought you guys might be a little bit heart heartbroken from the the loss on Saturday, so I wasn't going to bring it up. But this is the second time that Nebraska has brought me to Northwestern. I remembered when I walked into Seagull today and saw the form and function thing that I actually visited here several years ago. I think the year the building opened, and actually saw that and went on a tour with other Nebraska people. So. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, share some of the research that I've been doing on the use of examples to drive innovation. And today I'm going to kind of talk to you about two different research paths that I've been working on. One of the basis uh, for my research is I view design as both a process and a product. So I got my start at the University of Nebraska doing human factors product design, primarily in tool design, so hand tools. Um, I did some laparoscopic surgical tools, neutron detectors, all focused on improving the usability of the product. Uh, that led me to understand that it's not necessarily all about the packaging, but also about the interface design. Because the neutron detector we were working on, we improved it as much as we could from the packaging perspective, but the device that was actually connected to was absolutely horrible. So um, when I went to the University of Illinois, I really got interested in cognition and human-computer interaction and how we can better understand the design process and develop tools that better support that process. So I'm going to talk with you primarily about my work in uh, the d design process. And I'm going to talk to you about um, some stuff I do on changing the way that we use existing products to drive innovation. And also talk with you about some computer-based tools that I've used to help support designers in the example finding process. So the heart of my work actually started here right in the city of Chicago, uh, where I was looking at and interviewing designers from some of the companies that you guys have here. Um, and asking them about their idea generation techniques. So there's been a wide variety of examples used, or idea generation techniques used, but what do you actually use in practice to develop ideas? And what I found is that examples are the cornerstone of the creative design process. And one of the designers said, uh, you know, design used to be thought of as this design through scratch atmosphere where you develop a product that has never existed before in any form whatsoever. And now it's more of a design through synthesis environment where designers combine, adapt, or modify existing designs in order to generate new ideas. So I was talking with my research group last week about the fact that I was going to be here at Northwestern, and I said, give me a product that is an exemplification of a combination of two previous concepts. So I'm going to see if you guys can guess it. I'm going to give you the two products uh, that this new innovative product was made of. <coughs> if I say this product combines the comfort of a sweatshirt and the warmth of a blanket, what is that product? It's a Snuggie. Okay, so this is actually a fake product. This is a family Snuggie. Uh, it's not actually a real product. But the idea here is that it's a recombination of two previous concepts put together in a newer novel way that has never existed before. So I know everyone probably wants to go run out and get this, but again, this is a, this is a fake product. Uh, but the idea here is that we look at products that already exist and identify the components that can be reused or used for inspiration to actually inspire new design directions. And I you often use this quote when I talk about this area, uh, but Bill, Bicht, Bill Buxton wrote an article for um, Business Week in 2008. And he said, too often the obsession is with inventing something totally unique rather than extracting value from the creative understanding of what is already known. So doing our background work, determining the correct products to benchmarking off, understanding why those products succeed on the market, and using that to truly drive our innovation. But I wouldn't be here, my title wouldn't be Breakthroughs and Cautionary Tales if example usage was always a good thing. So I'm going to go all the way from the Snuggie back to the 1830s um, to when the passenger rail car was first being created. In this instance, the primary mode of transportation at the time was actually a horse and buggy system. And you can see here that the um, individual uh, that's driving the vehicle or controlling the horses um, is sitting in the front and that there's also people sitting on top and inside of the carriage system. Safety What's that? Safety first. Yeah, <laughs> safety first. Uh, so when they were developing the passenger rail car, this was the primary mode of transportation. They created this really innovative concept of actually having a locomotive, steam locomotive, driving this design. But if you look at the rail car systems used to transport the passengers, you see that it strongly resembles the original design of the stagecoach. And there were, what's, what's the primary reason why this was problematic? It's safety. What's different between this and a, and a horse and buggy system? Speed. Speed. So these things went a whopping 15 to 20 miles per hour. But when you're sitting on top of a vehicle, definitely not the most um, practical means. In addition, these horse, uh, the wheels were actually made of wood. 
And so there were several cases where the axles on the vehicles broke and people were ejected from the train system. Not necessarily the best uh, marketing scheme for the passenger rail car. So in this instance, instead of innovating truly off of the design of the passenger rail car, they just simply reused an existing design. And in this case, it was not a successful means of transportation. Now, if, I, if we fast forward again, I'm just going to keep fast forwarding and zooming out of history. Uh, there's a very famous lawsuit that's going on with Samsung and Apple, right? So Samsung uh, was said to have copied some of the logo designs from Apple um, or icon designs from Apple in their product. And if you see here, the phone logo on the iPhone looks remarkably similar to the phone icon on the Samsung, including the location, the color, and even the white phone used in it. If you do a little quick five-minute Google search, you'll actually find some of the benchmarking papers that Samsung used when developing the, uh, their version of the iPhone, or the new, their new product, I should say. Um, and they actually used these icons and benchmarked off them, but they failed to innovate in this space and instead reused that concept. This is what we term design fixation. So that when we are exposed to existing examples or existing products on the market, we often have a blind adherence um, to a set of ideas or concepts that limit the originality of our conceptual design. And the word blind here is really important because people are often unaware that they're actually being fixated by the existing design. If you ask them, they might think they developed a really innovative solution. You'll have to then show them a product that resembles that that's currently available. But we know that examples are frequently used in industry. So what we want to know is how can we understand the benefits of example usage, understand some of the limitations of what occurs in order to develop better methods and tools to support this process. And here's an interesting example of a positive use of uh, design examples. So when Apple was actually first coming out with the first um, iPod, uh, they referenced this design case. So in this case, Nikon um, in the early 1900s had done a second version of their camera and they were looking for a way to reinvent themselves on the market. Their camera was doing really well, but they wanted to expand their market base. And in particular, they wanted to reach out to the female market. So they hired one of the first industrial designers at the time and released it under a new name, the new camera. And I always have to describe this because it's hard to see on the projector, but it's in five distinct colors from left to right. It's orange, red, gray, green, and blue. Now, if we fast forward, I told you Apple benchmarked off of this case. What product does this remind you of? iPod or the iMac, right. So Apple knew about this case. They had two generations of the Apple iPod, white version, before they released it. The industrial designer was aware of this case and used that to actually drive the innovation process. So like I said, my research is really in understanding how we can use examples to drive an inspiration, understand what hinders us in order to improve methods and develop design tools. And I ground a lot of my research in psychological literature. And I'm really fascinated with the way these examples are used to actually drive innovation. So there's a model called search for ideas and associated memory. And what this says is that it's important not only what you know and what you're surrounded by, but also the examples that you start with. So if we ask someone to develop a new electronic toothbrush and we provide them with a benchmarking case, they use that to actually go through and search their memory um, and develop a solution. So they think of other products that they can relate it to and then use that information to then innovate one concept. So in this case, the person might have remembered maybe we can expand the rubber gripping around it. Once an idea is developed, then that idea becomes the benchmark that's used to search memory. And this process continues until all of the ideas have been created in that space. In other words, it's really important not only what they start from, but the sequential steps that they follow to produce an idea. Um, this is really familiar to the uh, work in long-term memory storage. So today I'm going to talk with you about two main areas. The first area is about this interaction we have with the product and how we can reduce fixation and increase design novelty by altering a d individual's uh, interaction with the example. So a lot of the studies that have been done on design fixation are where people are just provided with an image of an example and said, generate concepts. And they find, oh, they had some fixation on this example. So we wanted to know if there was some kind of significant interaction that we could add there to reduce this fixation effect. So what we did was we actually did a study on product dissection. So product dissection is used in industry and academia as a tool to help students and, and uh, people in industry identify opportunities for redesign. So in this process, they take it apart, they understand how it works, 
and they also identify how it's put together. Um, this is used um, in, traditionally in our engineering design courses as a way to help students uncover these opportunities. And it's been shown um, from an educational perspective that when individuals perform this dissection activity, they focus more on the functional aspects of the design as opposed to the form aspects. So in other words, by having this type of interaction, we can actually change the way that they think about the product. So we wanted to see that if we had them perform a product dissection of a, when they're on a redesign task, if we could actually alter the type of fixation and novelty they saw. So we did an exploratory study of this in our first year engineering design course, uh, where students were working in teams of four. We provided them with one or two electronic toothbrushes. Uh, get to the point of why we had two of them in a minute. And we asked them to dissect these toothbrushes within a team environment. They were given uh, 90 minutes, two hours, to uh, dissect the product and fill out a bill of materials for the product. And then a week later, they came back in and we did a 30-minute brainstorming section. Now, we broke the product into four main categories. We had them focus on either the brush head, the body design, the energy mechanism or how the toothbrush actually rotates, and also the power generation. And we wanted to see how closely their ideas resembled the original toothbrush design. But one of the things we did not control for intentionally was how much they actually dissected the product. So we wanted to see naturally in a team environment how much someone participated in each of these activities. So when they filled out the bill of materials, we actually had them identify which person dissected each component. So which one did the weighing, the measuring, um, and put the functional aspects on it. And we use this to create a ranking within each team of how much someone participated in the design activity. This was used as our exposure variable, or how much they participated in the dissection. So I told you design fixation is a blind adherence to a set of examples. In this instance, here's two toothbrush designs that actually were designed based off our study. Which one of these is fixated? Yeah, it looks almost verbatim identical to uh, what the original design looked like, which is funny because we told them to be as innovative as possible and we still get this, right? Um, so we needed to come up with some way to actually quantify how fixated they were instead of these just pairwise comparisons. So what we did was we basically created a hierarchy of all of the possible features that were available in the current design. So one of them was the number and location of the brush heads. The two toothbrushes we used had different brush heads. So this one had one brush head, and it rotated in a circular manner back and forth. So we, the, the rater, in this case, was asked to say, how similar or different is this design to the original? And we had this delineated all the way through. I think there are 15 questions per um, idea, and each participant generated, on average, eight ideas. So we had our raters answering a lot of questions about toothbrushes. We had an iterator reliability using this method of about 85%, so pretty decent. And then we came up with the fixation based off of the number of times they had a similar concept to the original design over the total number of times they addressed that feature. So very quickly, just to exemplify that, um, the example on the left says, it clearly states both in drawing and visually that it's about the same as the oral B. <laughs> so it's clearly a fixated concept. The one on the right actually was very different than the concept that they were given. And so they had a very low fixation rate. Now, do you think this is an innovative toothbrush head? Yeah, right, so this is like something we see on the market today, but it was different than the concept they got. And this gets into the fact, like I was saying, that we're, we're driven both by what we're provided with and our knowledge of what exists on the market. The other thing we wanted to look at was design novelty. And design novelty differs from fixation. Um, it will actually account for that fact that that toothbrush head was different uh, or, or probably was similar to other designs other people generated. So novelty is how unusual or unexpected an idea is. And the way we look at this feature is we look at it and compare how many times other individuals addressed that same feature in their design. So in this instance, there's a heated handle. So we look at how many other people had a heated handle in their design. If 90% of our participants had a heated handle, then it's not really a novel concept. So we used the method outlined by Shaw and Vargas Hernandez, which is a very um, well-known in the engineering design literature way of creating design novelty. And we actually averaged the novelty score of all the designs the participant generated. So in this case, uh, again, we have our not novel concept because we had participants that had a lot of examples that looked like the Oral-B toothbrush. Um, and this one here actually has mouthwash in it. So you can put mouthwash on your toothpaste. And very few people interjected mouthwash into the toothpaste design. So that was actually a highly novel idea. So the first question we sought to address, again, is does dissection affect design fixation? So your ability to move beyond the original concept. 
And what we found was that fixation actually reduced uh, based off of the more involved you were in the dissection activity. So this is a rating again from one to four, four being the person that participated the most frequently in the dissection activity. But the interesting thing is we only saw this effect for the form factor, so the brush head design and the toothbrush body. We didn't see it for the energy mechanism or the power generation. We hypothesized that this was because they knew less about that concept and they're first year students, so they couldn't really think outside of, of what they had seen within that. But we're actually working on a study right now where we're controlling for that exposure level to kind of understand this factor more. But we were really excited that we saw this negative drop in fixation um, throughout exposure. The second question we sought to address was, does dissection affect design novelty? And we found that it does affect it, and this is what we saw. A dip at three to very low novelty, and then another in increase at four. So all we can conclude from this study that we did, this exploratory study, is that there is some kind of impact of dissection on novelty, but we're not quite sure what that relationship is. And we saw it for everything, uh, the brush head, energy mechanism, and body design category. We saw a similar trend in the data set. So what this tells us is there's either some kind of sweet spot for dissection or likely that this, we need to understand this exposure and controlling for it more. The final area we looked at is does the example used affect design fixation and design novelty? What we found was the starting point for the design, which this should make intuitive sense because of the SIAM model, whatever toothbrush you start with as a dissection point had an influence on both the design fixation and the design novelty of the outcome. So what this means is that whatever you're picking for a benchmark for your product has a big influence on both how fixated you will become on it and how novel you are when generating ideas for the concept. So we're using this to actually drive a current study where we're looking at exploring the dissection of tangential products to inspire um, research uh, or idea generation in a different category. So um, in this case, maybe we have them um, dissect a milk frother and then develop ideas for a toothbrush. So how can we use these tangential product dissections to take some of the functional aspects of them and actually drive innovation in that space? Another thing that we have to worry about is the sustainability of product dissection. So I bought 40 IKEA milk frothers recently and uh, the person asked me why I was buying 40 of them. And I had to say, I'm not obsessed with lattes, we're actually killing your products. Um, so they're relatively inexpensive in that case, but uh, we still end up with this big pile of unused products. So, there's been some studies that have shown that virtual dissection has uh, no impact over phys uh, physically dissecting a product over the learning outcomes, but there's been nothing studied in terms of design novelty and design fixation. So this is an ongoing research area we're looking at. Yes. Does virtual dissection have the same effect? Or it has the same effect. Same effect. So, so they, they did some studies um, where they looked at dissecting something in a 3D PDF versus dissecting something um, in person and looked at the learning outcomes that they had or their ability to recall how the product works and there was no impact of the two methods. No so that was a positive thing. No on, on learning outcomes. Okay. So when you say you're yes. So, so this new, uh, no, we have not looked at the I Love Latte groups, but that would be a good one to look at. So actually what we did in this study was we, um, this, we just finished this study, um, in fact, last week. Well, we gave one group just a picture of this milk frother without any other content. The second one, we had them do a, a visual inspection where they had to actually sketch it and do some measurements of it. And then the third condition was they actually had to dissect the product and then they generated ideas for the same amount of times afterwards. So we were controlling the amount of the type of exposure they had to the activity. In addition to that, in this one, we're actually looking at, um, we saw a lot of steamers being presented because steamers, our I Love Latte users, know that steam is used as a common source to make lattes. Um, because we didn't account for that in the first study, most fixation stuff only looks at the product you're dissecting, not your knowledge of the space. So we're trying to account for some of that in this as well. Okay, um, so the second area that I wanted to focus on today was um, how can we help individuals in the example finding process? So we know that people go out and find examples. We know examples have an impact on the quality and of the ideas we generate. So how can we actually help them select ideas or examples that are going to help them generate ideas? Now the focus of this work comes with the fact that creative design results from a co-evolution of problem and solution space. That means that if we provide someone with a design problem, 
they're going it, to, it's ill-defined design problem. They're going to go through a um, iteration where they're adding constraints, taking constraints away, and kind of weaving their way around until they actually develop a solution. So they're framing the problem, developing solution, and kind of navigating themselves through the space. This is what um, Dorst and Key Cross referred to as reflective conversation. So that means when people are looking for examples, they're not only looking for things to inspire their design, but they're also looking for things to help them shape the design problem that they're solving. So we wanted to know how do people use the web to find examples outside of the going to the store and picking up a product, but how do they actually maneuver the space and what are some of the bottlenecks that they have in this process? So we call this searching for inspiration um, or what oftentimes is called to a serendipitous discovery. So in order to accomplish this, we had 18 participants. Uh, we had six industrial designs, six web designs, six graphic designers come into our lab and perform a design task. We monitored the keywords that they searched for, um, how they found them, and what their starting places were for these searches. And then once they found the examples, they were allowed to do this free form. They were allowed to develop solutions at any point. At the end of the 90-minute session, we then had an interview with them to understand what difficulties they came with and what their search strategy was for getting to those example cases. So when we look at what happens when we search for examples, in this task, the industrial designer was asked to design a product from recycling materials, recycled materials. So we didn't say what the product should be, and we didn't say what the recycled material should be. It was completely open-ended. So the first thing they needed to do was go into their memory and think of products that had been recycled. So this is actually, I'm going to illustrate a concept or a, a train of thought that one of the designers went through in our study. The first thing that they thought, they thought of was glass pot bottles. because They know that there's recycling of glass pot bottles. But when they went to Google Image Search, what they actually found was Golsh beer bottles. And they saw that they were green. So then they used this to drive reusing glass bottles. So they altered their search queue. They're trying to find something. And they found this picture of a wall made out of glass bottles. So some kind of building material made out of glass bottles. This then made them recall in their memory something that I had seen and learned about in an industrial design class, which is the Heineken house, which is a house made completely of Heineken bottles. So then they said, OK, so I want to do something with reusing glass bottles in the Heineken house. They search reusing glass bottles, and they see this fence design. And they say, aha, I got it. So they actually use all of this to create this new product that is, allows you to reuse glass bottles as a fencing mechanism to do landscaping in your yard. And the idea of this product is that the bottle slips on, and they can be used interchangeably to create any shape you need in it. The designer also specifies on here that it's at the ground level and that they're using the natural coloring that they had seen in the design as they were searching. So they came up with all of these criteria as they were searching. Now, again, this was the transformation of the problem and solution spaces they were going because they were given this very open design task that they were going for. Um, this designer, actually, this was the second part that they worked on. They started at shipping crates. They ended up here. So what we're really interested in, what were some of the obstacles that they had to overcome to get here? And we also wanted to identify the differences between industrial web and graphic designers. So we actually logged when they were searching, what type of searching they were doing. This is just a small scatter plot of when these keyword searches took place. One thing that we noticed was that when we gave web designers a task, a web design task, they just went to the websites that they knew. So they looked at, OK, I know the tried and true websites. If I have to design this campaign, I know a good campaign, I'm going to go there. They didn't really look for inspiration. They looked really just for specific artifacts. So all of their searches were based around finding content, not looking for inspiration. The industrial designers tended to follow a different process. And that process was search for images, develop a solution. Search for images, develop a solution. So they kind of had this sporadic dot pace. The final group, the graphic designers, what we saw that they did was they looked for as many different images as possible. They collected them all, they kind of hoarded them. They're kind of image hoarders. And then all of a sudden, they just created a whole bunch of ideas at the end. They recombined these. The difference between the graphic designers and, say, the industrial designers was they could literally reuse these images to create the outcome. So they could just, they were using Photoshop to actually start creating these solutions. So we used this and identified kind of this design process where they're using these keywords that they think of using them to reflect on their memory, make a new association, develop a new keyword, and they keep going through this process until they no longer develop new ideas. This is very similar to what I was just talking to about SIAM, search for ideas and associative memory. 
They're using this exact same process when they're coming up with new keywords for search. So we asked them about how they searched the web. And one of our designers said, helpful words suggest different design directions. During your searches, 90% of what you see is unhelpful. When I have a hit, that hit normally suggests other design directions. And what we found was that the designers were talking about stuff they saw on page 50 of the search results, stuff that was only kind of related. But the important thing was that they needed to build what that relationship was between those artifacts. And they also had to sift through 50 pages of image results before they got there. So they needed a, a more direct path to that solution. So in order to come up with these keywords that helped them develop these new search paths, they used a couple of tools. One is the visual thesaurus. Um, this is a tool that is literally based off of semantic relationships. It's available online. And so they would type in the word design and then look for different tangential research paths. Now the thing is, is no matter who uses this tool, you're always going to get the same results if you type in the same words. So it, no matter who's using this, they're going to see the same results based off of this. If we also think about the fact that these are going to be used as triggers in memory to look up tangential research paths, we're going to be kind of priming the same area of memory and we might not be coming up with these new different design directions. So there were some benefits to this because we got to find some opportunities for keyword searches, but there are also some obstacles to overcome. A second way they did it was they mind mapped or did a brain dump at the beginning and they thought of all of the words that they could possibly associate with that term, they wrote it down right when they started. And then they use those to derive these keyword searches throughout the experiences. But what we were really interested in is, okay, we know what you do, we know what the deficits are of them, but how can we improve example finding on the web? So at the time that we were working on this study, Nielsen had actually come out with a new study that looked at um, when you're finding information online, how do you discover that information? And they found that 18% of the market was using social media. This actually was a good memory trigger for myself because it helped me remember that when the participants were asked what could have improved your search experience, they said, I wish I could have talked to someone. I wish I could have, I've got my friend, they've really worked in this space, I want to talk with them. But one of the problems as designers actually working in industry is a lot of times there's IP issues associated with the content that you're designing. So you can't just go ask anyone. So we started thinking, okay, well people are using social medias for searching. We, want, we have people who want to use social media for search. So how can we use this idea of social search to actually help people develop these design ideas? So social search was defined as Nielsen as acts that make use of social interactions with others. These interactions may be explicit, implicit, co-located or remote, synchronous or asynchronous. We said, great, that sounds perfect, we want to do that. How do I ask someone their opinion on something or get it without actually asking them? So how do I receive that information? So this led us to develop an interface called Tweetspiration. This information uh, uses Twitter as a means to develop keywords or associations based off of Twitter content. So this interface was originally developed um, for, as a Firefox plugin, and it was used to be, meant to be used tangentially with a web search. So the user would have the Tweetspiration bar open on the left, and they would have the image search open up on the right, and they could use these interchangeably to find new ideas. The way the interface worked is you plugged in an idea, so this person was using, uh, developing an ad campaign for UNICEF. They looked for the word UNICEF help, because they wanted to help UNICEF, they wanted to figure out what that relationship was. And all of a sudden, it goes, it gathers 100 of the most recent Twitter messages, it then shows you the frequency in which the words appear in those messages. And you can then click on the words um, in the word cloud and it shows you the Twitter content that's associated with that. So one of the things that we found really interesting about this is they were able to understand a lot about what UNICEF is, what their mission is. They saw that they were working in Ghana, they were working with children, teenagers, girls, school, all stuff that it would have taken them a long time to actually go through and delve through um, on the UNICEF website or other organizations. In addition to that, there was this Twitter message or a thing that kept showing proud of Selena. And at the time, Selena Gomez was actually an ambassador for UNICEF and was doing some work in it. And people started building into this, their campaign ideas. It had just happened it, and they were using that as inspiration for their designs. So we performed a um, study where we had people, we gave them the design task, develop an ad campaign for UNICEF on campus. We gave them 20 minutes to work on it search for information, search for examples, and after that 20 minute period expired, we introduced Tweetspiration. 
Now, the reason for waiting is we thought Tweetspiration might be most useful when someone has hit a block. They don't know what they're going to work on anymore. They feel like they've exhausted all of their resources. And this might provide inspiration for further searches. And that was, in fact, what we found. We had them um, perform a task. We looked at the keywords they generated before and after Tweetspiration. And we found that it allowed them to shift their perspective on the design problem, to see it from a different perspective. And it performed, allowed them to um, have inspiration for further searches or searches they wouldn't have thought of before using that tool. So we saw that there was some kind of benefit to using this tool. But we wanted to see over other word association tools how something like a Twitter search, social search engine could be useful. So we performed a final study where we had designers search for examples. And we provided them with one or three tools. And then we had them develop solutions. This is a study that we just finished. So I'm going to share some qualitative results that we had. The, the, the interface that we used was still Tweetspiration. But this time, we did not allow them to do any searching without the interface. So they could use Tweetspiration whenever they wanted at any point. Um, but they couldn't use any other search application. So they weren't allowed to have Mozilla open to do any searches. The next one that they could use was something called Snappy Words. Uh, this is actually a free visual thesaurus online. And this is the exact same as the visual thesaurus, except that it was free for our users to use. And this has the same thing. The lines, different lines represent different semantic relationships between the terms. This also has a very different visualization than the Tweetspiration. This was another thing we were testing, was the user's fun factor or their interactions with this interface. And finally, we had them use wordassociations.net, which might be my favorite word association tool because it is based off 18th century classic literature. And you would never think that that would perhaps be a word association tool. So you find some really unique um, word associations here. So the word I typed in was design, and Sparta is number six on the list. Not necessarily something I would have related. So um, they also have a, yet again, different visualization. Uh, the lines on the length of the line represents how many times it appeared in close proximity to the word you searched for. Another useful aspect of this tool was it has different definition of what the word you searched for is on the right hand side. So it provides them with different contexts or different ways of thinking about the problem. So we performed a study where we had participants perform two design tasks. Each of the design tasks they were either use, allowed to use Treespiration, WordNet, or word associations or snappy words, and they were asked to perform two design tasks. The first one was to develop a spool-proof coffee mug. Um, they were asked to explore as many problem statements and I generate as many ideas as possible. And the other place was develop a, an assistive technology device for the workplace. Again, asked to develop as many problems that could potentially occur and many ideas to, um, that they could generate for each problem statement. And the reason that we were really focusing on both the problem and the ideas is because of this reflective conversation that happens. And we wanted to see how these tools actually shaped the problems that they focused on. In addition, we chose two wildly different tasks, the spill-proof coffee cup. Everyone has seen one in some form or another. They're always sitting on the tables at these talks. And uh, while uh, workplace disability, a lot of students aren't familiar with those that, in that interaction. So we wanted to see how something like Twitter or um, how something like a thesaurus could actually guide these design tasks. So overall, what we found was the number one finding was that Tweetspiration actually helped the users develop empathy. It was like tapping into the minds of the users, again, without asking anyone. So it wasn't just that it was developing these associations with them, but it was allowing them to understand what some of the difficulties were that the people were feeling when using these products. Um, one, of the, one of the quotes that I love from this study is that, they were talking about, they typed in the word coffee, and what they thought was random showed up, the word pothole. They said, how does pothole relate to the word coffee? And they said, aha. Someone's driving down the car, they hit a pothole, and then their coffee spills. So it almost makes them force an analogy between these concepts. The next thing we found was that people really liked these definitions that occurred on word associations, because it made them think about the problem from a different perspective. And on the snappy word tool, they could also hover over the different words and see the definitions of them. And they are constantly doing that to try to drive their design process. And finally, the last thing that we found was that the relationship should be visualized. They really liked the snappy words that had this interaction. They really liked interacting with that product. And so we know that on future iterations, 
we need to improve that on our device. So again, the reason why we looked at this was we wanted to have this um, constant changing co-evolution of problem and solution space and then identify this. We're actually in the process right now of going through all of the ideas that they developed. There's 511 ideas created and over 125 problem statements explored. And so we're looking at the variety, uh, creativity, and novelty of the design ideas they generated using these interfaces. So I would like to say that we have redesigned Tweetspiration um, as an iPhone app. And uh, we did involve some of the functionality that we saw in the device. Uh, the first thing is that we do still have the word cloud. Um, just because of the iOS that we were working on, it was the easiest to implement. But we're looking at history features that use some of these uh, more fluid search paths. Um, and within the new tweet bar, we have both C definition and launch new cloud. So it allows people to seamlessly transition from one search to another. And of course, the definition feature we found was really important during the design process. So now we have um, different definitions that um, show up during the user. So this is actually going to be ready next week in the App Store. Uh, so you guys can download or use it. It's free to use. So again, uh, kind of an overview of what I went over today is uh, my research looks at the process of design, looking at both tools and methods to support the process, either through computer-based interfaces or an understanding of design methods that can better influence the design process. So at this time, I will take any questions. Mm -hmm. They're ready, they're, they're fertile ground, and the people just have to get started. They just can't get away from making the thing that looks just like that same thing. Yeah. Well, I think one of it is awareness, and one of it is bringing awareness of what's going on and educating people about fixation, because even if pe because people don't realize it's happening. And so one is that educational component. The second is, like you said, getting people away from that concept and getting started. And it's so important that that first idea be really innovative, because that idea is going to then influence the rest of them that are created. And that's why this, this kind of train of thought is why people like brainstorming techniques, because it gets these wild ideas out there more efficiently. So we haven't looked at it in the context of, of problem starting, but it would be interested to look at our, at our ideas that we're developing the study based off of that. Yes? If you look at all the design fixation within Teams, uh, with, with respect to the web search, uh, it's like a, how Teams might uh, do that. You did a lot of individual stuff. Yeah, I did do a lot of individual stuff. So, so the idea is that when people typically, before they go to a brainstorming session, we like them to do individual search and generation before they come through, um, do uh, group brainstorming. And it's because uh, people become social loafers or they feel um, there's the, um, you feel scared or don't feel like contributing. So I haven't looked at the search from a group perspective. Um, it's, it might be like happening when people are in the same room, but it's, yeah. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't looked at that yet. It's an interesting idea. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, your work brings to mind Marsh Fisher's idea Fisher product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't worked on, for, so there's a lot of stuff on forced analogies. So you give them a concept and you say, make an analogy between these concepts. I was more looking at it from perspective of, okay, let's give you an analogy. And we're going to give you that analogy by looking at these other relationships that other people have made. So I haven't looked at that. I'm kind of reverse engineering it, is I'm going to give you the an analogy and then see what you can produce based off of that analogy that I'm providing you with. I, I mean, it's a tangential path. So it allows you, like, if you're not, if you're in a different country or something, trying to gain knowledge or insights onto how other people think about it, you can use it from that perspective. But this is meant to be like a tangential research path, not something that would replace those methods. Because I think um, people aren't going to live, well, some people do live tweet what happens in their daily life all the time. Um, but it's, it's an unusual circumstance. And so you're not going to get those real life 
impressions without actually going out and doing those field observations. Yeah. Yeah. So that's our next step right now. So after we launch the app, we're doing a a, a field study on right. on the use of it, a diary study of them using it. Yeah, so the words are randomly placed on the screen, and that's intentionally because we didn't want to do hierarchically because that would have only been stuff really related, and we wanted to have some of those random asso random associations. Um, however, we do filter some words. We do not. I did not do a live demo of this because we don't filter certain terms that um, might not be appropriate for a talk. Um, but we do tw uh, we do filter um, small small words out of it. Yeah, so the word cloud, um, the, the tweet bar changes based off the word you click on. So they okay. start with all of the words that are contained within it, and then it filters based off of the other words. Okay. So if you search for design and creative showed up, yeah. and you clicked on creative in the, in the cloud, then it's only tweets that contain both terms. So you get that linkage and relationship between them. So right now they've just been using it like uh, so we, we I've, I've piloted it with a couple of designers and gotten feedback on it and really they've been using it just as a tool to think about the problem and when they're in the early problem forming perspective they actually haven't because we're not having it as a sidebar and not not marketing towards image search they've been using it actually just more on the problem framing and understanding what the problem is um, where I'm I'm interested in linking it with images. Uh, because designers are very visual thinkers, and so developing that connection, I've been testing out some concepts of, of how we can better do that. Well, so when designers do searches, they're going to search for things that are not only in the market that they're designing, but they'll also draw inspiration from fashion and other resources within it. But it's making that connection and thinking to actually go out and get those products. So of course they're getting them, and in fact they'll use things like core plot that are like, like uh, prototypes or ideas that people have created and not actually implemented, and use those as inspiration for their design. So they definitely go out and use those. So an example doesn't have to be a finished product. It can be an image. It can be uh, a physical prototype, like you said. Um, and there's also been some studies that have been looked at um, developing prototypes uh, instead of sketching uh, when creating ideas, and they found people are less fixated when they're actually building it because they have to think about how it works. <laughs> so. Yes. On that note, uh, prior to research, did you discover any strategies for tactics that designers were using to avoid? Well, yes and no. So, so I. I, when we were doing this study, when we were actually out asking designers what they used and how they used examples during the design process, um, one designer said that he tried to divorce himself from examples. He used that term, divorce himself. And he said, I tried to not look at examples, but as designers, um, unlike artists, we need to know what's going on in the world around us. And so, uh, okay, I <laughs> should back up for a second. What that means is that they're publishing something, they want to get a patent on it, therefore they need to know what other products are existing and what they need to avoid, and also use as inspiration. I did find, I, I guess here, there is a specific case I remember, they were working on a campaign, um, and they found something, um, when they were working on the UNICEF campaign, they found the red, the, the red campaign, and they collected all of those um, images so they knew what to avoid. So the type of font to avoid, the type of, so, so yeah, they have come up with strategies to avoid it. Yes? On the topic of fixation, does your research touch on the occurrence of students getting fixated to their own first idea? <laughs> how did you 
Yeah, so that's like the variation. Like that first design idea you develop is going to control the rest of your path. So yes, we see minor modifications of the previous concept. When we say be as crazy as possible, think of as many ideas as possible, I'll be like, I'll milk frother with two whisks. <coughs> and then they'll three whisks. We'll put six on each one. So yeah, there's definitely that, that path that occurs. Unless you break that cycle somewhere and make them aware of it, um, we do constantly see that happening. Well, I had the Samsung example. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's just it's as problematic as ever. It might not be as severe as uh, these, that, that case I showed of people being thrown off of the vehicle, but it's apparent in design all around us. If you look at products that, that come to market, they, they had the chance to be really um, innovative, and they just made a mod minor modification off of the existing product. Um, Coffee cup is a perfect example. People are like, this is good enough. We'll just add like a different lid opening mechanism. That'll be perfect. But it's just very still, very similar to the original concept. So we still see just these minor modifications happening. How do you um, balance the difference between standardization and not novelty? For example, when I look at that Samsung phone, I'm expecting a green button with a phone on it so that I know where I'm supposed to talk, right? I mean, that's every phone since, you know, they've started making cell phones has a green Yeah, that is a really good one. So, so this goes back to the case. I, I'll, I'll make a parallel between this and web design, right? So the web designer went out. They looked at tried and true websites. They said, this is a good sidebar design. This is good layout. People go to this website. They use it all the time. I'm going to just reuse that. I'm going to alter it slightly. You know, maybe use a different font or something. But I'm going to alter it slightly. So when we get into usability of things and when people's expectation, there's this fuzzy area. So I, I, I'm not going to get into a bait of Samsung and Apple. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, usability creates these interesting gray areas of what is usability and what is really fixation on the design problem. So, so probably Samsung saw it and said, this is good, it's usable, let's use it. So I, I have no answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, you could make a measure of usability and expectations. Mm -hmm. Fixation, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Um, none of the stuff I've been looking at right now is really usability related, but that would be really interesting to, to see how that plays in. Simple question, how much will the app cost? Zero dollars and zero cents. <laughs> Well, one is to look at failures, right? So products that have failed and why they failed. So I think everyone's familiar with the baddesigns.com. It's been around for a really long time. Yes, no? Some. Well, baddesigns.com, I think it literally has been around for 10 years. It's very outdated. Um, but understanding why products failed is a very good starting point. Because as uh, designers, we have, we have to know why things didn't succeed. Um, as far as tools go for human-centered design, I'll have to think about that one. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about that one. Okay.